Um, this is our talking piece. Uh, we are gathered here today um, on the TRU campus. We would like to begin with the territorial acknowledgement. I would like to start by saying um, this is the traditional unceded territory of the Swakmak people. We gratefully acknowledge that the Kamloops campus of the Brampton University University is on the traditional lands of the Chikamloops de Swakmak within Swakmak Bulu. We are very honored and privileged to live and learn here on this land. Um, I'm going to talk about the allyship. I found this topic very valuable and intriguing. I feel like it is a right step in the right direction to move towards the healing process in collaboration with indigenous communities. Um, I will also discuss some ways how we can be effective allies. So to begin, allyship is an active, consistent, practice of unlearning and de-evaluating in which a person with a privilege um, seeks to work with in solidarity with a marginalized group. In order to be allied, people with privilege must actively engage in decolonizing processes. Um, as, an, as an ally, our intentions are to foster the reconciliation of historical and contemporary wrongdoings and rectification of the inequitable colonial system. We can do so by actively supporting social justice to eliminate social inequalities, we also need to establish a meaningful relationship with the people in the communities. Uh, professionally, I can apply this uh, into my own healthcare practice. I can um, make sure I know about the people's culture in order to be, provide competent care. Um, I will seek to incorporate people's culture into my caring plans uh, in order to provide client-centered and trauma-informed care. Uh, personally, you can also I'll try and identify and acknowledge the territories I'm in. Um, I will try to find out what it means to be a recent immigrant in Canada and recognize myself as a settler too. Um, I will try actively to learn more about indigenous culture rather than just it, um, do, like depending on indigenous people to try and educate me. Um, some of the ways we can be effective ally, like I said, you must you should try and recognize yourself as a settler. We all came here, we all worked hard, and so it feels like home to us, but it is still at the expense of the indigenous people. Um, we can, like, we got very good at like, acknowledging the territorial lands, so that's the other practice we can do. Um, we can always acknowledge the territories we are in. We can ask that if we are ever unsure, how to properly um, identify the people from there. We can see what the Canada's history is and how things are, has happened and is happening still today. We can try and learn the 94, uh, 94 uh, the acts from the Truth and Reconciliation Report. There's a video on their YouTube you can watch. Um, we can support Indigenous TV programming, movies, and listen to the Indigenous artists. You can also wear an orange shirt on September 30th to promote awareness about the Indian residential schools and how it impacted everyone. We need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. We need to give space for marginalized voices to be heard. We need to be okay with silence because generally speaking, indigenous people are more comfortable with silence. Interrupting another person is a sign of disrespect in indigenous culture. So the first step to building trust with indigenous people is to learn to be comfortable with silence. We need to slow it down. We need to realize that silence isn't about being rude or offensive, it's a culture norm. We need to spend more time listening and less time talking. Um, the other thing that's important about being an ally is it's a continuous process. It's not a designation you can learn and hold forever. It's done. I, we must continually engage in self-reflexivity and consistently work at being an ally through learning, acting in a manner, and sustaining relationship with indigenous people. You can't label yourself as an ally, but I have found from my research is like it's not appropriate for non-indigenous people to describe themselves with the title of being an ally to indigenous people. It's really up to indigenous people to try and evaluate and assert the degree to which they think we are the allies to them. I would like to pass the golden things to Julie now. Sorry. Um, so I will be talking a little bit about the Indian app today. Um, after doing the Indi or the timeline in class and reading a bit further into the 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act, 
it became quite obvious to me that there's a lot of things that happen to Indigenous peoples, which I originally was more than what I had thought. Um, we learned a lot about residential schools in my high school, but I feel like we didn't go into depth about everything that was really taken away from Indigenous peoples. Um, in the acknowledgement section of the 21 Things You Might Not Know About the Indian Act, the author stated that they think it is critical that non-Indigenous Canadians be aware of how deeply the Indian Act penetrated, controlled, and continues to control most aspects of the lives of First Nations. And the author further noted that it was used as an instrument of oppression. Many things were also a shock to me when we were filling out our timeline in the first week of class. For example, one that I was not aware of before was that between 1927 and 1951, jail sentences were given to anyone that lent Indigenous people um, money for lawyers or legal counsel. I think this is super impactful as it clearly shows that not only did they want the rights of Indigenous peoples taken away, but in addition to that, they did not want them to be able to fight back, so they took away their ability to access any legal help when they would need it. Um, I also thought it was really sad to learn about the fact that things such as potlatches became illegal in the late 1800s. This is extremely important to Indigenous culture and is not something that should ever be taken away from them. Many potlatches were used to display wealth and also share knowledge through stories and other means as well. It's sad to see that it got worse from here and that Indigenous peoples were not allowed to practice any traditions in the mid-1900s. Without the ability to practice these traditions, it greatly impacts future generations as these traditions may be lost. Furthermore, in 1867, only white men could vote. Um, and in addition to that, if a woman married a non-Indigenous man, that individual would lose their status. The idea that it was so easy for Indigenous peoples to lose status cards meant really stunned me, um, just because it was a clear indication that along with everything else that was done to these people, they were a real large attempt at colonization. Um, we also learned that the last residential school didn't close until the 1990s. I found this really astonishing as um, many had to be aware of the extreme detrimental effects that this had on Indigenous peoples and their culture. The residential schools also forced Indigenous children to not speak their native language. This created, created a divide amongst the children and their families, and sometimes they could no longer communicate with their elders or other family members. This also created a gap in the ability for these children to learn stories, which is often how they share their generational knowledge. The residential schools took away so many rights of the Indigenous peoples and further was trying to rid them of their own ways. Understanding all of this, it is crucial for me to take this into account when caring for Indigenous peoples. Knowing the impacts of generational trauma and keeping that in mind when providing care will allow me to provide culturally aware and safe care to patients. Thank you. Um, I will address the sin of racism in healthcare. Referring to the book and Iran and Gitmuk, he for God on January 25th, 1979. What I couldn't understand was why the doctor waited two days after her death reported. It was too cruel of him. It was hard enough on the family having to move the next. Then to have something like this slapped on our finger. We put our trust on the doctor, believing him when he told us there was nothing to worry about. This statement shows the systemic racism in healthcare towards indigenous people in Canada has been devastating effects, including disproportionate health disparities. Indigenous people have higher rates of chronic diseases and lower life expectancy than the indigenous population. Limited access to care, indigenous people often face barriers to healthcare services, including long wait times, lack of transportation, and cultural insensitivity from healthcare providers. Mistrust of the healthcare system. Historically, indigenous people have experienced trauma, including the forced removal of children from their families and, and uh, the imposition of Western medical practices, leading to distrust of the healthcare system. Health-related culture loss. Indigenous culture have a rich history of traditional healing practices that are being lost to the lack of integration of these practices into the healthcare system. Misdiagnosis and inadequate care. Indigenous people are often misdiagnosed and receive inadequate care due to culture misunderstanding and lack of culture competency among health providers. Stop the stereotype terms toward indigenous people like alcoholics and addicts. These examples demonstrate the needs for systemic change and more culturally safe healthcare system for indigenous people in Canada. 
but can fundamentally destigmatize and misconception. We can reduce systemic racism in healthcare and provide Indigenous Canadians with more culturally safe and equitable system. This may be done through teaching healthcare professionals about Indigenous people. History and experiences also creating cultural competencies that addresses health inequities and treatment access. So when reflecting on the different types of racisms that we discussed in class and analyzed the different aspects of racism that was presented in the 21 things you didn't know about the Indian Act and in the novel Errors of Judgment, it highlighted the many experiences of racism and its impacts on indigenous Indigenous individuals and their communities. I was very surprised by the many lengths that the federal, federal and local governments went to in order to have greater control over and prevent the success of Indigenous people. For example, I was very surprised um, by the many permits that were put in place, especially when Indigenous were becoming uh, very successful farmers, but then they were prevented from selling their goods um, to the settlers. Um, so it governed how these people lived, especially preventing them from reaching their full potential and being successful members of society. Um, there was also racism evident in the novel Errors of Judgment um, surrounding the hair of Renee, which I found very disturbing that many of the individuals involved in her care ignored her system her symptoms and failed to provide care, which ultimately, unfortunately, led, led to her death. Were these, um, were these scenarios emphasized the need for us to step up and be advocates for clients in times of need, which will make us better allies? So from my reflection of what I've learned so far in class, what really devastated me was learning about human story I, I could not believe that something amazing could happen in 2015, but who would think that this would have happened like decades ago or even like hundreds of years ago, but to learn about it and for him to be treated that way. And it was very evident that racism and discrimination right from the beginning of his story, how they assumed right away that he was an alcoholic just because he accidentally ingested methanol, which they did not even know at that time. And what really um, struck me the most is that if there could have just been one person who stood up for him, if I could have been an ally to him, then he wouldn't have ended up that way. Like, he would have died that way with such an injustice. So I'm talking about privilege, and I just want to start off by saying I'm so grateful for everything I have, and I feel like I didn't really know that until I got into this class, got into nursing and actually did self-reflection. And I feel like me advocating um, is super important just because my parents, like they are immigrants and I'm a person of color and they're also a person of color. And there was a situation um, where my grandma went to the hospital, she had a bunch of medical concerns and she just got turned away, denied, refused. They refused to help, refused to do tests and all of that, right? So it's me being in that position and thinking, wow, like I could really advocate for herself. I sat there, advocated for her, and that's my privilege, right? I'm able to do that. I have that language, I have that education, I have all of that. But it didn't really come easy. Like, I had to build, build up that privilege. I feel like as a person of color, me going to school, me using my power for good, I feel like that's something I'm gonna be taking with me. So I feel like a lot of people don't really use the power that they have. I'm putting connotations is because it could be good power, bad power, and it's just like the way that you use it. And I feel like I did have an accent growing up as a person of color and physical appearances. It's not like how everyone would say normal, you know? So I feel like in the book, in the textbook, in Google, all of it, privilege is based on variety of social identities, race, gender, religion, and I feel like it's very narrow-minded, it's not open whatsoever, and this is according to society norms. And I feel like that is something that's really devastating because when we reflect back at the book, the indigenous woman, she wasn't able to protect herself, she wasn't able to protect her kid, and it was because the doctor did have more privilege than her, than her and had a higher title, obviously. 
So I feel like that also played an impact on Amanda and she wasn't able to stand up for herself and protest against the doctor. It's because of her religion and what she believes in. And I feel like I finally understand that now and like it's time to advocate. Okay, so I'm just talking about two different topics because uh, as a person not from Canada, I was completely unaware of anything related to the indigenous people here. So learning about their history has been very formative and educative. Um, a lot of topics we discussed were a lot darker than I thought they would be, but uh, the ones that stood out to me the most were the Indian Act and the schools, because uh, I was just very surprised at how bad some of the actions done against them were and how they're still going through some of the effects caused by that. Um, the part that devastated me the most were the schools because um, I had no knowledge prior to coming here about them. Just uh, how bad the situation really was. And um, I had a belief that obviously everything they went through wouldn't be as bad as it is now, but after class I learned about the key story and stuff, which showed me that some of the cases we learned about are happening way in much more in the modern times than we thought they were. And uh, they were very, I think the way I can help indigenous people is just being more educated and getting other people educated about it as well. Because uh, I feel like a lot of people who don't learn about it in class will just never know about it even though they're living in this place. So just letting people know about their presence would be the best help I can make. <clears throat> uh, today my topic is colonialism, uh, like it was uh, one of the most first topics that we studied in as well as and I know what you were talking about it. Colonialism is a practice in which one country takes control of another country and uses its best sources and people for their own benefit and reasons and take profit. This often involves the exploitation and oppression of the people and also the resources of that country in the, in the controlled country. Most of people like are confused with imperialism and colonialism. Imperialism refers to the political and economic control exerted by one country over another through indirect means, such as economic and cultural influence. Both are ways of exerting power and control over others, but imperialism is more focused on indirect methods like colonization involves direct control over the territory. The community who colonized Canada were primarily uh, European settlers, including British and also Canadian government. These settlers took their own customer, customs and beliefs and, and imposed them on the indigenous people of the region. This often resulted in suppression of indigenous cultures and traditional practices and the exploration of land and resources. The settlers focused forced indigenous people off their ancestral land and into reservations leading to the loss of traditional territories and ways of life. The indigenous children were taken from their families and sent to residential schools where they were subjected to physical, emotional, and cultural abuse. And this had a lasting impact on indigenous people and their communities with many still struggling with the effects of colonialism today, including property, uh, poverty, trauma, and loss of cultural identity. The indigenous people of like, Canada, Canada continue to fight for recognition and protection of their rights and culture. So in conclusion, we can say that colonialism had a devastating impact on the indigenous people of Canada. The European settlers took control of the land, the resources, the people, the postmen, and a lot more. The settlers imposed their culture and laws, suppressing traditional customs and things like that. So the legacy of colonialism continues to affect indigenous people. We're just gonna open the floor up if anyone has any takeaways that they got from someone else or anything else they want to add on at the end. So the floor is open. 
Um, I guess, yeah, what I, what I found, um, I guess we can do that we're talking circle. Um, I was, like you mentioned Keegan, and I mentioned Keegan, like the things that are still happening today, we might not know everything that's happening around us, but it's still surprising to find that, that like, there's still so many racial disparities in, particularly in the healthcare system that's still happening. It's not a thing in the past, so we must continue still like learn and be better ourselves. Um, and Arlen said like the only way, the best way we can do is like be educated ourselves and then educate others. So that's a great way. Um, the other thing, the other point I would like to mention is that I think we need to have more education like even internationally. I feel like if you, like a lot of us moved here from different countries and we had no idea about like residential schools or indigenous, indigenous people at all. So I think that's an area we can all improve on. I think you made actually a really good point. Um, I feel like knowing your biases and judgment, especially like working as a nurse or whatever field you're in, you're always going to experience racism. You're always going to experience some sort. You're going to always witness something like that. So I feel like that's really important in that situation to like advocate for that person and just you know self reflection. I'll just add to what Scarf and Aryan said. Like I would agree with him prior to coming here to Canada. I did not know anything about residential schools at all. When I heard something about residential schools, I just thought, oh, it's like school. Like I did not know about the entire story upon finding about it. It was really informative and like do know about the history and also letting my mom know because she didn't come to school up here and my other brother also didn't know. So it was, it's just really devastating to find out about it. But yeah, it's also really just building off of that like I think it's important to know what's going on but also to learn from them and see how can we enhance the care or how we interact with this population of that are unfortunately very vulnerable the majority of the time and just by learning more we can become better advocates and have better relationships with them which would also lead to better allyship on this a little bit but the more knowledge the better I feel like it's always like the best way because I feel like the more we continue to educate ourselves and educate others the more people that are aware and the more people that can advocate for patients or you know take it into your field or your daily life whatever way you possibly can um, yeah say to educate people but obviously no person's gonna want to be educated unless they want to do it themselves so I think the only other thing you can do is uh, if you see something happening like for example the thing we learned about those doctors playing the drinking game in the hospital if you can just step up to something like that or any just an example like anything happening in front of you someone being called a racial slur or something if you can just step up, I think that's the bare minimum you can do, I think. In my personal opinion, like I have seen that it is not a problem and we are not experiencing it nowadays. But we can see it in just little places, but not in a number one. And people are getting educated here and there. I think we, we have come, like, we have made good progress um, in terms of racism, but I think there's still lots of work still to be done. Um, we could uh, definitely continue to work on it and be better. So I think this is, we'll conclude our talking circle now.